Good evening. Thanks for joining this Parent University webinar. We are just opening up the webinar and waiting for all of our registrants to enter into the room. So it'll be just a moment. Okay, I see lots of people who registered joining the webinar. So I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, please know that this webinar is recorded and good evening and thank you for joining us. My name is Ann Risso and I'm part of the communications department for the Douglas County School District. Welcome to this evening's Douglas County School District Parent University webinar. And with the help of our partner, Sky Ridge Medical Center, our goal of these webinars is to provide relevant and timely content for Douglas County parents and students. Next Monday, February 5th, marks the beginning of National School Counseling Week. And with the purpose of that, to focus public attention on the unique contribution of <clears throat> school counselors within the United States school systems. And in honor of that, the topic of tonight's Parent University is the role of today's school counselor. Tonight's panelists are all Douglas County School District staff, including Dr. Kelly Smith, who is the Director of Health, Wellness, and Prevention for the Student Support Services Department. And we also are joined by Renee Colley and Camby Crabb who are both lead counselors also in our school district's health, wellness, and prevention department. And a quick note that time permitting, we will have a question and answer session following this presentation. So thank you, Kelly, Renee, and Camby for your time today. And um, I think we are ready to start with our presentation. Thank you, Anne. Thank you all for joining us tonight. So we would like to go over the role of the school counselor in today's school setting. Um, just a little overview for our school counseling programs in Douglas County. We do have a 250 to one ratio in all of our secondary schools, so middle schools and high schools. There's also at least one counselor in all elementary schools and some principals at the elementary level have funded a second counselor for higher needs schools or larger populations. We also are aligning our school counseling programs with the national best practices and in doing so addressing three care, three key areas which are the academics social emotional and post secondary readiness we have been in uh we are in our third year with our own professional development um district wide with our counseling department learning the systems to put into place to really align with a comprehensive counseling program or to have one. Um, one of our big pushes is the equity and access to post-secondary readiness. Thanks, Camby. Um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the role of the school counselor. So this is very different from times when um, many of us went to school and we used to have guidance counselors. Um, our school counselors are actually licensed school counselors that have gone to a master's program to be able to deliver these programs within schools. Um, so when they come into a school setting, they really want to design and deliver school counseling programs that improve student outcomes in the areas of academic, social, emotional, and college and career pathways. Um, they want to be able to advocate and mediate, coordinate, consult, lead, collaborate with teachers, administrators, and parents to make sure that our students are successful. Um, they also want to be able to lead and advocate and collaborate to promote equity and access for all students in the three areas that Canby had spoken about before. Um, and while doing all of this, they are really taught their ethical and professional standards to make sure that they are continuing to grow and they are continuing um, to meet the ever-changing needs of our students and the ever-changing needs of post-secondary readiness um, to make sure that their students are receiving the best um, counseling program that they can to meet all of their needs. So what does this mean to you as a parent? 
Um, so there's kind of two different layers that when a counselor really starts to plan their program that they work on. And one is what we like to call tier one, which is something that all students get. This is, we wanna make sure that all students kind of have those developmental needs. Um, and the way we know those developmental needs because they're you know changing trends and we have to keep up to date on them so often and different areas have different kind of trends and, and needs. And we wanna make sure that we're staying in the forefront of that for information and skills that are relevant for our students. Um, so we teach classroom lessons based on those needs. So after data analysis of discipline, attendance, and academics, we follow a very systematic approach to make sure that we are um, continuing to monitor the data and continuing to monitor the, monitor the trajectory of our not only our building and our school, but our community and then our district as well. So um, an example of this may be if fourth graders are showing an increase in discipline referrals for impulsive behavior, the counselor would then want to analyze and look at the data and even receive some narrative data um, on what kind of the root cause of that problem is. And then they would teach class strategies to help regulate you know, that impulsivity and perspective taking if the data showed that the root cause might be the lagging skill in that area. Um, the same for kind of high school students. If there's a low participation in PSAT for the 10th grade, um, the counselor can teach 10th graders a lesson on why taking the test can help with their college and career planning. So we wanted to see is the root cause maybe be that 10th graders are spreading the world word that this isn't an important test anyways, or whatever that looks like. So we really wanna make sure that we're addressing the root cause and supplying students with what they need for post-secondary readiness and success. Okay. The second um, tier that we kind of talk about is narrowing in. So if our students aren't responding to the kind of larger um, base that we're providing with them, we're still noticing that they're lagging some skills. Um, you know, and it's still kind of a barrier to them being able to access and do their best in academics, social relationships and attendance. We then take that small group with the same kind of process, um, we'll analyze some of the data and then be able to make a more customized um, approach to those students to be able to layer in another kind of support um, to teach them that skill maybe in a different way or more one-on-one -on -one or help with the application of that skill to ensure that our students um, are receiving that same skill as their as their peers. So just one example on this one um, would be, you know, four students are showing anxiety around taking math tests. Uh, the counselor can teach coping strategies so that a group of students are able to decrease their anxiety around math. And of course, this would come from talking to those four students and asking them, what are your barriers? And then looking at some of the data to see, oh, well, this only happens when we're, when we're taking a math test. And so leading the students and kind of building their own plan and taking action with why is this, you know, a problem in one setting and not in another setting. And so that we're able to help them navigate and kind of break down the root cause so that they're finding the information relevant. So we as counselors divide our work into four areas, although there's the three um, categories of how we interact with students, but within our practice of developing and delivering a comprehensive counseling program, we have the four categories of define, manage, deliver, and assess. In that define category, that's where we create our programs based from the student standards as well as our own professional standards. Um, in manage, we're gonna make sure that the program is designed and implemented to get results. So that is doing pre and post tests before those small groups like Renee said, or perhaps even um, the larger groups um, as well, so that we know, are they understanding what they're being taught? And then are they putting it into practice as well? Um, deliver instruction to students um, and also consult with others on students behalf. So we have many different roles within the school community. So we might 
consult with our RTI um, person in the building. We might consult with our school psychologist. Um, it just really depends. It might even just be the students, teachers, um, but on their behalf, trying to figure out how best to meet their needs in that academic, um, personal, social, and the uh, post-secondary. And then counselors also assess their program for effectiveness. And this happens um, kind of like in a cycle. So every year they're doing this, but also with every um, layered support that they're doing, either it's tier one, tier two, or even the tier three. They're constantly monitoring to make sure that what they're doing is getting results. And if it's not, then maybe we need to go back to that root cause to figure out what might be the barrier. So as we said, counselors define their program through standards. There are three sets of standards. There's student standards with mindsets and behaviors. Um, I'm gonna click on this and see if it pulls up. Hopefully it does for you guys. Uh, maybe, oh, right here. So here's a document which shows the mindsets and behaviors. So there's six mindsets um, in here that we encourage students um, to have these or develop these mindsets for themselves. And then there's the behavior standards here, which there's 36 of these. And they're broken into the three categories of learning strategies, self-management skills, and social skills as well. So these are the standards by which we believe in students and what they're capable of, what they're capable of learning. Um, so that's just one piece of that. that. Like I said, there are three of them. Um, oops, let me go back. All right. And then for, for counselors, we have professional standards, which include ethical standards so that this is we're doing right by our students, essentially. And then the school professional standards and competencies is another piece of it, as we said before. Um, and this is something that we are kind of holding ourselves accountable for. And here's this document as well, kind of broken out the same way, which is that we also have mindsets, there's seven of those. And then the behaviors here are broken down into professional foundation, direct and indirect services. So that's when we're working one-on-one -on -one with a student or when we're consulting on their behalf. And then there's planning and assessment of the program itself. Okay. So each year, um, a counselor, even once these things are developed, the counselor will then um, continue to address them and appraise whether or not they are still um, valid and if whether or not this is still a focus. Um, again, with this, with the ever-changing um, environment of education, we want to make sure that it is constantly relevant. So this is not a program that counselors can create and then laminate and put on a shelf. Um, they are continuing to adjust it, not only in a yearly cycle, but ongoing as needs change for their students. Um, but this is kind of where the program starts when you want to manage your program. So uh, you would create a vision and a mission statement. And with those, you really want to reflect on um, you know, not only what the school counselor is pulling in from our national standards, but you want to be able to look and pull in from both your district and your school's vision and mission statement, because the goal of your school counseling program is it supports your school's um, overarching focus and overarching goals. And it it's a different approach to supporting students, but it's not completely separate. We want to make sure that it is integrated into the school community, into the school system, and that it is not working against those systems or working against those that are trying to achieve other school, you know, other goals within the school building. Um, so when you create your goal, you really want to make sure that it is lined and um, with the data. So you're pulling what maybe your principal has looked at for, you know, kind of their own goals and then what they have given your staff as goals. And then you're evaluating that data with the school counselor lens to see what maybe you um, can pick up on that nobody else has. Um, for example, when I was a school counselor, we looked at some of the iReady data and we had noticed that we had a group of students 
who were falling within 10 points of being on grade level, um, but had received no other interventions because they weren't scoring low enough where they were receiving, were receiving math interventions, um, but they were also kids who frequently scored A's and B's in the class. They were just having problems with testing. So they were just missing all of the supports academically um, that were kind of caught to support those kids. And so what we did um, as a counseling team is we went in and taught them test taking strategies and motivational skills and problem solving skills, um, mostly because nobody wanted us teaching math, um, but because those students already had those skills, they just needed to know how to access them. Um, so by that, we were able to evaluate the trends in the data to determine where that developmental skill gap lied. And it was really in that social emotional range, not in the academic range. Um, so with that, um, we then did some program planning. So you will explore the data, align with the school-wide goals, as I said, and then reach students who may need extra support or have not received support in the past and then identify and explore the need for systemic change to support student success. Sometimes we find that it's it's the adults maybe that have created systems that don't make sense and that are creating barriers for students. And so through our data and the unique lens of a school counselor, sometimes we realize that some systemic change or policies need to be advocated for um, on the student's behalf in order to ensure their success. Um, we do have two areas of focus, which are direct services, and this is when we're sitting with the student directly. So even when we are doing something on the student's behalf or on for, you know, to push the student further in a different direction, if they are not directly with us, it is considered an indirect service. So within direct services, um, it would be that classroom instruction, individual student planning, so college and career um, planning, if we are choosing schedules, those kinds of things are all student planning, and then responsive student services. So this is responding to students' needs in the moment, and this could be safety concerns, this could be anxiety concerns, this could be um, attendance concerns. So it's responding to students that are having um, a situation that need that needs support in the moment that maybe wasn't planned for or that we did not find the data to support. And, the, and a school counseling program's goal is to spend 80% of their time in direct student services. So the, the three listed above. And then indirect services are kind of all the meeting portions um, and advocacy that we do behind the scenes. So this is meeting with other support service departments um, to find resources, parents, teachers, collaboration of all of that on a student's behalf, consultation with any outside resources, and then providing re, um, referrals for when we cannot meet student needs. The last component is the assessing of uh, the comprehensive program. Um, and this is done in a different ways. Um, of course, the goal is just to de determine the effectiveness um, and make sure that what we had planned out for the year is exactly like, did we show growth and progress or did we not meet our mark. And so we do this in a variety of ways. One of the ways in order to see that our counselors are aligning their time appropriately would be um, a use of time calendar, which is done in the fall and in the spring. And it's got done over a, a typical week, if you will. And they can assess how they're doing on their time is a lot of time spent on testing or is a lot of time spent in the classroom, like what are they doing? Um, so that's one way. We also have um, an annual calendar that's that can is that should be released to all the, the entire school and also parents so that you can see what your students are going to be getting from their counseling program. And then we also have uh, advisory council that counselor teams put together and we have participants on there from students, parents, um, administration, teachers, who are all hearing about these goals and looking at the growth in progress and seeing where we can go from there as well. Um, looking at that results data from the classroom or the small groups, as Renee had mentioned as well, or any um, specific direct interventions as well. Um, 
we use a couple of different platforms in order to do that assessment or appraisal. One is ICAP, so that's Individual Career and Academic Plan, which is a state uh, mandate that all students grades six through 12 are given the opportunity to work on this career and academic plan, essentially. We use Naviance, hopefully you guys have heard of it, um, as the platform to deliver that. Um, but we also have in there anything from career assessments to um, learning and productivity, understanding how they might learn best. Um, and so looking through that also provides counselors, parents, and students another way to see how they're doing overall in that particular well, realm. And then there's academic planning as well. Some of our schools use the academic planner that's in Infinite Campus, um, and others might do it in another way, either maybe spreadsheets um, or an, a, like a Google Doc that they use with their students as well. Um, part of the national standards talks about advocacy for your program and making sure that you're sharing out your results. Um, so as we're kind of implementing the national standards and the best practice with having these data-driven results and data-driven counseling programs, we have asked that our school counseling programs make these um, school counseling spotlights. So Last year, we had some schools that were ready to do this. This year, we, all of our schools will be ready to do this, and they'll be coming up with them. Um, they'll be uh, creating them during National School Counselor Week to spotlight and highlight their programs uh, in order for this to be shared with their community. And so you will be able to see graphs. Um, you will be able to see how many students were impacted by one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, you will be able to see the growth from students uh, from the counseling topics, a lot of the a lot of our counselors have chosen to focus on attendance, achievement, or behavior goals. And then when they go in and teach classroom lessons, they're measuring um, the change maybe in attendance rates um, before and after these skills are taught to, to show student confidence in the classroom, for example, or to show academic success. Um, and so they will be able to present that to their school communities moving forward. And these are just two examples from schools that were able to complete them last year. Yes, we're really looking forward to next week when we get to see all of our teams put these together. Mm -hmm. And these are some things that school counselors do not do. Um, they do not provide therapy. Counselors instruct on lagging skills. So we're really assessing what is that barrier to learning and what is something, what is a developmentally appropriate skill that we can help the student to be able to apply in order to achieve their best academically and then use those skills for post-secondary um, readiness. And, and really we look at those skills that the colleges and universities have told us that students need to have in the long run. Um, we do not participate in discipline decisions, so the counselors stay neutral to preserve the counselor-student relationship. Our role is usually advocacy for the student um, on those parts and supporting students through some of those tough times. And then we do not provide long-term mental health support. So we are limited to six to eight week lessons of lagging skills, and then once um, those six to eight weeks of lagging skills have been worked on. If there's more intense needs or if there is truthfully ongoing mental health or therapy that needs um, to continue, we would refer out um, so that that student could do it in a more appropriate setting. As Anne mentioned, next week is the National School Counselor Week, which is a time that we like to celebrate the programming that our counselors have um, developed and are implementing within their buildings. Um, and so it's a nice time for like sending them an email of appreciation. Maybe you know that your student's counselor worked with them on a lagging skill or had them in a small group and things are going great. Maybe sending them a quick email Students have often written us thank you notes as well on those kind of appreciation um, notes as well. So just something to think about for next week. 
we're at the end of our slideshow, but we would love to take any questions that you might have. Not seeing any questions coming through quite yet. We'll give that a few moments. Um, one thing that I am curious about is, can you tell um, our viewers the best way for students to get in touch with a counselor or families or parents to um, reach out to a counselor as far as like scheduling an appointment? What is the process for that? I would say each school might have their own thing. Um, what I would tell parents uh, is email to me is best. I'm going to be on my computer more than I might be in my office and seeing the red light on my phone. Um, and so I think shooting them an email is a good way of doing it. Some of our counseling teams have ways that count, uh, students can actually make appointments with their counselors without even having to go into the counseling office, uh, which is a nice added bonus too. So it just really depends. Renee, how did you guys do it? Yeah, I would say check the websites as well. Um, most schools will have a drop down that you can look at for the counselor. And then if there's an online referral form, so if you want to request to see a counselor or speak with a counselor, you would be able to find it on that website. So we did the same um, situation. So email for sure because um, we're frequently in front of students, but if it, there is an online, and then of course your students always know how to get a hold of us, that's for sure. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, we do have one question. Are there mental health workers that work with the schools from the outside that come in and see students for mental health services? So some of that may be privately coordinated. It's not um, generic across the board and those kinds of things. Um, and it's not something at the moment that that the school counselor coordinates, unless it was for outside referrals. Okay. And how do you think this program has strengthened the counselors the most? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say giving them focus, um, not letting the day happen to them, but them kind of taking charge of their day in a very systemic way, I would say. Um, yeah, I would say giving them a purpose for what their work is. I think for me, the other piece that is always a big aha with um, being able to implement this is it doesn't require student advocacy. So we're actually being proactive for students um, and being able to catch those that, you know, kind of giving a voice to the voiceless, if you will, and, and reaching out to them, which I have found means so much to our students that we're able to say, let us support you before they're, they're even needing to ask for that. I love that. That's a really wonderful um, act of, of kindness, re uh, reaching out to the students that way. So, um, and I really uh, thought it was interesting, your school counseling spotlights. Um, I'm a very visual person. So seeing all of the categories of um, information that you have on there updated is, it makes it very interesting. And um, so excited to learn more about that. Um, I don't know if we have any other questions coming up. Um, we'll give it a, just another moment. And if not, then we will probably wrap things up. Um, nope, I I think you have created all of the answers to all of the questions. So, <laughs> um, so I guess we will just wrap thing up. Oh, oh, we got a thank you. So yay for that. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so, uh, Kelly, Renee, Camby, and everyone who attended this evening, thank you so much for your time and, um, uh, supporting Parent University. Uh, a recording of this webinar will be posted soon on the Douglas County School District Parent University webpage at www.douglascountyschool or DCS dk12.org. And a link to this webinar recording will also be provided to you at the email that you use to register for the webinar. I'm just going to take a peek here. I think we might have one additional question here. 
Nope, no more questions. Just happy, happy National School Counselor Week to all of you. I hope um, you have some great activities for um, all of the kindness and support that you provide for our school district. Um, moving on to our next parent university, it is planned for February 28th. And it's on the topic of teens and drugs. Um, this particular webinar will discuss a pilot program currently being used in four of our middle schools and um, is also planning to expand. And it's created to prevent vaping of nicotine, marijuana, and other drugs. Uh, so please look for announcements about this webinar, uh, registration of coming emails and social media and our website newsletters as well. Um, and thank you again for joining us and to our partner Sky Ridge Medical Center. Uh, we hope you all have a wonderful evening. Happy National School Counselor Week next week. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks a lot. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you.